Hi everyone, this is Donato Cabrera and welcome to this week's Music Wise. Uh, we are so fortunate this week to have a fantastic, fantastic musician with us who do, has done so much more than just the art form, which is what we are all, um, we're all hoping to do, but she has been able to achieve this for many years. And uh, without further ado, let's just start chatting with our, our friend this week, our guest, Monica Yunus. Hello, hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi there. Yeah, well, I just finally have this ch a chance to speak with you. Um, we, as the music, as we all know, the music world is, is smaller than we even- Teeny oh, tiny. Teeny tiny and, and smaller than we may even want it to be sometimes. Yes. <laughs> in, this case, in this case, we've been threatening to meet each other in person for years and now, well, this is as good as it gets for now, but it's, 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 it's a, just a joy to have you here uh, on MusicWise this week. And I have to hand it to our mutual uh, friend and of course your your partner in crime and so many my partner in crime my sister in arms all of that yes shout out to Camille <laughs> we were we were chatting then and I have been such a, a, a fan and supporter of what you two have done um, for so many years which is sing for hope and I asked her this question and, and of course they're always two sides of uh, how things get going. So from your point of view, tell us a little bit about, tell us about Sing for Hope, what it means, what it means for you, how, how this idea came to be, and how has it changed over the years, if at all? Wow, yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me today. And yes, we have definitely crossed paths so many times, so it's really nice to, to get together, even if, virtually. I'd rather be having a glass of wine and having this conversation, but here we are, global pandemic 2020. Um, but yeah, so Sing for Hope, I'm sure Camille sort of shared this, and um, it was a very, uh, a very crazy situation in our world and in our beloved city of New York, New York which was that 9-11 hit, and um, both Camille and I were students at Juilliard, and we wanted to do something in those days after. Um, I remember being on the subway. I was actually starting my master's degree. That, that was the first day. And um, I was watching TV and I saw the news hit and, you know, it's very shocking. And so I think, well, I got to go to school today. So I get on the subway. And of course, the subway doesn't go past a certain point. And at this point I'm panicked after what I saw. So I get off the subway and um, I get out at 72nd Street making my way um, towards Lincoln Center and Juilliard. And um, I see on the television screens in some store windows that at this point, one of the towers has come down. So I continue to go to school again in complete shock. And people that I had seen every day um, security guards around Lincoln Center stopped me, asked me for my ID and said, you need to go home. And so I walked back to my apartment in Harlem at 116th Street from 66th Street. And I just, I remember everything about that day, you know, gorgeous blue skies. And um, it was just, it was, it was that moment, you know, it was that moment that forever is etched in, in one's brain, particularly a young person and particularly a young person studying music. And, um, you know, it was always my dream to perform, have the opportunity, if I ever got it, to perform on some of the world's, you know, most wonderful stages. And luckily, you know, now with hindsight, I can say that, that I've, I've gotten the opportunity to do that. But on that day, you know, I, I remember thinking, um, you know, how do we, how do we do this? How do we do this thing that is so transformative and yet can feel so distant for so many people. So not knowing anything about anything, we gathered some friends um, and we went to the firehouse behind Juilliard um, that was among some of the first responders that day. And they lost um, many of their men. And at the time they were waiting for them to come back. And so Camille and I gathered some friends and knocked on the door of the firehouse and said, we're just 
from around the corner at Juilliard and we'd like to sing something for you if that's okay. And they stood there and listened to our songs. And, you know, we sang some patriotic songs. We sang some, uh, just some things that we thought that could be soothing. And these big hulking, you know, firemen who hadn't had a moment's respite at this point and were still very much waiting for people to come home. They just started crying and it was this very overwhelming feeling. And that was kind of our start of Sing for Hope from our, our Juilliard experience. Um, and uh, I think, you know, in our, in our very youthful exuberance, we thought that maybe, you know, our world would, would heal in ways that we wouldn't have to go through these kind of tragic things more or less in our lives. And that of course is extremely naive. And, um, you know, we are, we're here, uh, globally now going through this, this pandemic together. And I think as I did then that the role of the artist within that conversation is so incredibly seminal and so incredibly important to heal, to discover, to connect, and to just frankly, just to be with one another in these moments. And that's at every possible thing that you can think of. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there because I can go on and on about this, but um, that was kind of very much the sort of um, initial moments of, of, of the start of, of, our, of our Sing for Hope journey. Well, I, as someone who was also living in Manhattan during that time and on that day, uh, I was at, I was at uh, already at Manhattan School of Music. I had um, a work study at the in the orchestra library, mm -hmm. and I was preparing. I was uh, had been given the honor of conducting the opera scenes for the MSM Opera Studio that fall. And I was already in the library, you know, dutifully marking all of the parts. Of course. And um, we had a little radio on in 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 the. Uh, orchestra library and it, you know of course the, the initial radio announcements were this small plane hits at the tower and so the, it's so interesting that everyone mentions what a beautiful day it was because it was you know those fall days in, 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 in New York City are so special because they're no it's it's at that moment in time where it's not oppressively hot any longer. It's just nice and sunny. And you can go outside and be normal yes. without, you know, sweating up a storm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. In fact, and, this, this past weekend I was thinking that, oh, it's such a beautiful day. And I know I spoke to some friends and yeah, it, it just, they don't come around very often. Let's put it that way. But, you know, um, to, to think that, th I remember then when I also had my girlfriend at the time and I, we, we grabbed a livery cab. Uh, we had to head back uptown as well. And we went up, it, it took us to go from 125th Street to 150th Street. It took us like 45 minutes. And we thought, you know, why aren't we walking? Like everyone else is. By that time at the end of it, oh, yeah. in the afternoon, it's hard to imagine, but the entire length of Broadway was just full of people walking. <laughs> it was a sea of people. Yep. And um, you know, we finally headed up and made it to my to my place on 207th Street. But I think what what is what is true and what was so prescient of what you and Camille and, and your friends did at that time was indeed what took us, us being New Yorkers first and foremost, uh, out of our really uh, stage of trauma were was music and uh whether it was these incredible acts of kindness that you guys did that of, would lead into what you created later on of course but uh, un, up unto the larger events at, like mm -hmm. Yankee stadium and, and madison square garden that right it happened a few months later but even the major institutions i you know they uh the new york philharmonic recently rebroadcasts that incredible Brahms German Requiem that Kurt Mazur conducted uh, just days after 9-11. And that performance was broadcast. I remember listening to it on, on whatever it was, WQXR, WNYC, I can't remember which one, that evening, and thinking that what an incredible act of 
of healing that only music and musicians can mm -hmm. bring. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. and and you I and now here we are oddly in in something that has brought everyone to that standstill that 9/11 created, especially for New Yorkers, and it will be the artists that will lead us, that will allow us to feel together again. 100%, 100%. It's so true. And, you know, I think that um, allowing for that space and giving people that opportunity to create and reimagine, really. I mean, this is a, an enormous opportunity for us to reimagine how we want our not only our artistic lives, but the, the economy, I mean, much, much greater conversations, just generally speaking, this is an opportunity for us to re-envision how we place artists at the center instead of always sort of the, the luxury item. It, it's The arts are not a need to have. They, right. they fuel our economy, $877 billion are fueled are you know are it's, it's an enormous input into our economy so to say that it's something that um that is not a need to have is is really uh short-sighted needless to say not to mention the fact that you know artists will be the last to return to their more um traditional forms as, as far as going back into the theaters and going back into ways that we um you know traditionally have experienced the arts but that too provides an opportunity for us to to in, to reimagine to innovate on what we think an artistic experience should be and we're all forced to figure that out now well while you you and camille and and, and your colleagues weren't forced necessarily to create sing for sing for hope i'm still I'm curious about, you know, it's one thing to to have the courage and the wherewithal and and, the, and just a sense of of wanting to reach out and help someone through your art form like you did that day with the firemen. But it's another thing to create a 501c3, nonprofit uh, yes. a board, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, yeah. and, and we all as artists always have wonderful ideas, but it's it's hard to make something into a reality what were what was what were some of the people that helped you in that initial stage to create sing for hope yeah well it definitely takes a village and yes it's one thing to have an idea it's another thing to implement it and to get people on board with your idea and to then fund your idea and to manage a staff around your idea and all all those different things so we have learned much in our 15 years um that frankly my juilliard training did not necessarily prepare me for as far as the dots on a page mm -hmm. but what i do hold to be absolute truth is that the artistic training, the artistic mindset, the habits of mind that we develop and practice every day are something that fuel um, our putting our idea into the world with, with great gusto. And so there have been so many people along the way. Um, I can think of um, one that I'd love to point out and that is my, my dear friend, I, I, I always like to say at 90 years young, I would like to be her when I grow up. Um, Ava Holler is just one of those people that when you meet her, um, she's an incredible woman with a lot of um, wonderful energy. And she and I met at an event um, a few years into our Sing for Hope idea. And she said, well, you need to create a board. You need to, you know, you you, this isn't something that you can just do on your computers in your spare time. Like you have to, this is, you have to support this. And she's like, and I'm going to help you do that. And so she would sit around with us in her apartment and brainstorm and bring in all kinds of people, several of whom are still on our board because she brought them in. Um, and she's just somebody who really loves to bring ideas to fruition. And because of her, we were able to really think through what an organizational structure is um, to kind of think through how the, the, the funding structure should be. And, you know, to this day, we, we talk many hours trying to sort of think through what the next stage is and because it's an ever evolving process. You know, what we did in years one through three are not necessarily the things that help fuel us years four through six and certainly not necessarily in year 15. Um, so it's been an interesting process and the kind, one of the things that I, I think I'm most um, 
most grateful for, frankly, is the the people that I that have poured so much of their love and their energy and their and their funding to this idea. Um, and we're we're just we're super lucky to have the kind of board that we do who do really work on making sure that Sing for Hope continues and and brings um, its sort of special specialness into communities that need it. Uh I'm curious, has the, our current situation changed at all? Your mission, your directives, your short-term, medium-term goals for Sing for Hope? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I think what's really interesting is that, um, you know, our mission will not change. Our delivery systems will change. So, for example, when we go into... Um, when we go into nursing homes, we go in person. And certainly right now, the nursing homes, elder care facilities, veterans facilities that we work with are not accepting guests of any kind. So um, we've had to rethink how that delivery system works. So we very quickly pivoted to virtual and um, virtual in the sense that there's some give and take. It's not just listening to even a live performance in this format. That's wonderful. We definitely have that as an option, but building out sort of the, the, um, the more interactive options, you know, whether it's um, responsive painting, whether it's actual painting with an artist, like, you know, we're all going to be on the screen and we're gonna paint this together and here's some tutorials, um, whether it's a sing-along, whether it's a moving movement exercise class for the elderly, um, or I, I like to call them our elders, not our elderly, our elders. Um, so it's really about rethinking that delivery system. Another thing that we did fairly quickly was um, something that we're calling Sing for Hope Graham. So musical gifts delivered via Zoom or, um, or just on your phone. You know, so many people cannot be in person together. And yet the birthdays, anniversaries, graduations, Mother's Day, Father's Days have passed. And it doesn't mean that you can't celebrate that. So why not um, gift someone a Sing for Hope Graham where they will call you up and say, Hi, I'm, you know, I'm Monica Yunus. I'm a Sing for Hope artist and your friend um, or your son or whoever sent you this Sing for Hope Gram, I, do you have a few minutes? I'd love to perform a song. And many of our artists are so touched by that because it's an opportunity to connect with um, an audience that we haven't been able to connect with since March. And so it's, a, it's, a, um, it's something that we pay our artists to do because as we know, 95% of, of our stages in the United States are closed right now. Um, and so many artists and everyone behind the scenes is also struggling to be out of work. So this was a way that we could pivot from our volunteer model to a paid model while still giving um, you know, a wonderful opportunity to connect through this musical gift. Let's watch the video that you've shared with us about Sing for Hope. Sure. Sing for Hope mobilizes world-class artists who donate time and talent to volunteer services that benefit schools, hospitals, and communities. Since 2006, Sing for Hope's programs have uplifted and inspired thousands of people in underserved schools, hospitals, veteran centers, and community organizations. To date, we have partnered with 250 nonprofit organizations, mobilized 3,500 artists in volunteer service, reached 40,000 school children, and placed 400 artist design pianos throughout our city's parks and public spaces, a symbol and celebration of art for all. We do believe that it is very important for young people to have an introduction to the arts. A lot of our young people have never really seen a real piano up front and center, so it's, it's amazing and it's fun to sit down with them and really play and, and see that energy and excitement. This year, thanks to a new partnership with the Department of Education, Sing for Hope is placing 50 pianos in 50 public schools across all five boroughs, bringing new harmonies into classrooms and benefiting an estimated 16,000 school children. As head of the New York City Housing Authority Youth Chorus, I've seen the difference that this organization makes in the life of young people. Sing for Hope brings a wealth of knowledge, talent, 
and education to young people. And the teaching artists that come from Sing for Hope really act as excellent role models. And it really makes a world of difference. I'm a praying man and I pray every day for the right help. And Sing for Hope is the right help. Where Sing for Hope fits in at Mount Sinai um, is that they bring what I can only describe as enlightened beauty to the lives of patients who are, for the most part, trapped in the hospital. It's more than just the art, um, the music, the dance, and the singing. They bring the compassion and the humanity because what they bring is people who perform. Not a television set that plays music, not an iPod or a radio, but an actual human being whose mere presence um, proves to our patients that they still matter, despite how dysfunctional healthcare is. Um, it proves to our doctors that the patients are human beings surrounded by a world of culture and art and beauty. I think this is the greatest public art project ever. Every day we look out, there's at least like a, a family of four or five people that are all playing. You can tell half of them have never played a piano before. You know, as soon as someone sits down and plays, everyone stops and gathers around and you have this sort of immediate, temporary moment of community. The Sing for Hope pianos transform New York City. For three weeks in the summer, there are these hot spots that are bringing people and communities to life. People are startled to see this colorful, crazy, beautiful instrument in the middle of a street. You don't expect a piano to be painted, you don't expect it to be out on the streets. And you'll walk up and you'll see this mini community in New York. Each January, we bring all 88 pianos into our studio. I've never seen 88 pianos in the same space. These artists, they're putting their heart and soul into these pianos. Dreams and nightmares and bird feathers layered on top of layers on top of layers. Playing with the physical presence of the piano. You feel the artist's investment in the piece. It's very moving. There are a lot of walls up between people and the consumption of art. So we're bringing the art to them. We're making art radically accessible to all. We break down that barrier, and they can touch it, and they can hear it, and they can experience it in a completely new way. And after their two weeks on the street, these pianos go on to live lives. They get to be placed in schools and in hospitals, and we send our artists into those spaces, and they do mini performances and mini master classes. You say, oh, you put a piano in the South Bronx, and people are going to destroy it, and that's not the case. This piano has challenged that stereotype because people can appreciate good things. We are worthy of this piano. First and foremost, music is uplifting. When you play music, you can find self-worth. Keeps the soul up high. It's good for you to, to be able to have the, that outlet. It gives me joy, and it lets me know that I can give other people joy. Art is just an easy way for us to feel connected as humans. People will gather around it and people will interact. When you see it, you will stop and you will look at it. To see all those people come together, people who probably would have never noticed each other walking down the street, was inspiring. It's about the creative spark that lives in every person. The theme of Sing for Hope is art for all. It's about connecting people with the creative spirit that's inside all of us. great video. I'm curious, how did you uh, get connected with the visual artists? I noticed one of them said it was a volunteer, but how, what was, how was that connection formed? Oh, hold on. There we go. There we go. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, we called it Sing for Hope because Camille and I are singers, but as you very astutely see, that we have lots and lots of different artists from every kind of genre. So we have dancers, instrumentalists, visual artists, of course. And so for the Sing for Hope Pianos, it is powered by volunteer artists. Um, and, you know, it's funny to me to watch that particular video because it's so, I, I miss being with people. I miss all that connectivity, those little hands on the pianos, um, which seems so, um, so different now. <laughs> so um, needless to say this year, um, 
we did not have the synchro piano be because of the because of the global pandemic in the way that we know and love the synchro pianos in New York City. Um, but um, we are thinking of ways to bring the Sync for Hope pianos back into a larger geographical orbit. So we're working on that. Um, as far as the artists and how we select artists, we have an RFP that goes out to request for proposal and we have applications from all over the world. Um, we've had artists um, from uh, Taiwan, Taipei, Taiwan, who um, I, I remember she created a beautiful Sync for Hope piano that sat in front of the Brooklyn Public Library. Um, and so we have, and we have many artists that come back year after year and they spend so much time creating these gorgeous works of art. And I think about all the, the different, you know, creative tentacles that come out of every artist from year to year. Um, it's not a very usual canvas, the piano. And so to have it, um, Camille and I like to refer to them as creatures because they all have their own little personalities that, that come to life through these incredible artists. And it's something that, you know, it just attracts anyone and everyone to come, whether or not you know how to play is kind of beside the point. It's just an attractive magnet that brings people together. I Well, I certainly think that as you mentioned that your goal is to reach beyond New York City and to increase your geographical orbit. And I think that this is a great example of how a community anywhere absolutely can work together across the the fields of, of the artistic artistic fields and work within a community to provide something that just again only we can provide only art can provide right right it's a space it's a creative space it's an opportunity to tell a story through the art on a sing for hope piano it's an opportunity to come together obviously and make music together it's an opportunity to get to know someone in your neighborhood that you've never met before and have an open conversation it's an invitation mm -hmm. for community making and now more than ever i think we need that um particularly in our our um in, in our communities. I mean, we, we desperately need that. And again, it's an opportunity to sort of think about how we as artists um, contribute to that conversation in a time when people are really struggling against loneliness and isolation. And again, artists, you know, can rethink how that delivery system is um, most, uh, is, is optimized, frankly. Tell us about your path to music. Your personal path. I was that kid who would not stop singing in my driveway. I would sing to the trees. I would sing to the birds. I would sing to whoever would listen. And I'm sure my neighbors thought I was nuts because I like clearly remember singing at the top of my lungs was this, in was my driveway. This, was this some, someone else in your family? What, was it, my was grandmother it? had a beautiful wow. voice. My mother's mother had a beautiful voice, gorgeous voice. I sang growing up with her in my Russian Orthodox church beautiful music, um, just, you know, beautiful chant and grew up with that in, in my, in my ear with her and then started taking voice lessons when I was 11 with a beautiful voice, um, a beautiful soprano, Kira Baklanova. She was a protege of Rosa Poncel's and she happened wow. to live in New Jersey near me. And so I would, um, go to her home and be really nervous because her, um, her former husband, um, was a conductor, Igor Chichagov, who used to accompany Rosa Poncel. And they lived together in Lakewood, New Jersey. And I would drive there once a week. My grandmother would drive me and sit through my voice lessons at 11 and onward um, week to week. Was, and was their place, I'm curious, because I, I can imagine what it was like. Was it like going into the, the previous century? I mean, the 19th century when you walked into their house? No, it's funny. They had a very, no, I mean, aside from her, you know, live portrait of her as Tosca in the, <laughs> you know, I mean, um, no, other than that, it was very, I would say it was more 1950s than, okay. than yeah, but it was really, um, yeah, it was so, I, I just, I see it so clearly, you know, when I close my eyes and I lost um, Igor last summer and it was just, it just broke my heart. You know, he just was a, a, a someone who influenced me so much musically as well as Kira and Kira passed in 2014 too. So it's very close. And um, they were like my surrogate grandparents and, and were a huge part of my growing up. Um, I also was in the children's course at the Metropolitan Opera. So I would, my mother would dutifully drive me in every 
weekend and nights when I had shows uh, from New Jersey and stay very late, sometimes not even going to the opera. Like, I don't know what she did. I think she would, you know, go grab some food or something, you know, around Lincoln Center. And what was, um, what was your first show? Do you remember? <laughs> it was butt sick. <laughs> <laughs> You can't make this up. <laughs> That's just, that, that lovely yeah, I bet you didn't think that was going to be the first opera. I, I mean, it's so, it's so interesting because uh, I don't know if you know the composer Charles Coleman. He still lives in New York City. He was in the, was in the children's chorus. Oh, okay. And also, you may know this already, but Debbie Gibson. Who yes, I knew that. She was in the, that. And, and she lives in Las Vegas. And okay. we talked about her experience at the in the Met Children's Chorus, and it's with all, Eleanor oh, Doria, of course, it had to be Eleanor. Of course, it was, and and that 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 and, of, and I can I can, I'm sure you have stories to share as well of of that incredible woman, but of course, invariably, it's I mean, it's usually Bohem, but yeah, um, or, or I was too or, tall for Bohem, which uh, makes me laugh because I'm five foot two. So it didn't really make sense, but I, you know, she was like, no, 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 you're too tall, you're too tall, kid. We're gonna keep you oh. off stage for a butt sec instead. So I, either it was that or I, maybe I did do Bohem. I Nevertheless, I mean, it's hilarious that your first memory at, at the at the Met is in the children's chorus is butt sec because, I mean, for me, you know, it is interesting though, and 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 yes, of course, it's <laughs> it's not the most. Um, Let's say not uh, so peppy that one. <laughs> yeah, it's not so peppy. But in terms of an evening of evening of pure drama, that's oh, one yeah. of the operas I always recommend because it's for someone who doesn't know the trappings of opera. Who sure. Wants yeah. To go experience something that is truly that's going to be dramatic. That's not terribly too long. Yep. Okay. Uh, that's one of the ones I always recommend. Salome yes. as well. I always recommend Salome, um, and and I think that it's still hilarious. It's what sick was your first one. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, that is that is that is fascinating because you're to me uh, to sing in that chorus or any children's chorus, opera, operatic children's chorus, which are far and few between. But you're on the stage from a young age next to these. Incredible voices, which I'm sure you still feel like today, right? When you're when you're st when you're now singing on that stage. I mean, moment, when I went life. when I went to make my debut, Elena met me at the stage door, and um, she was like, "Come on, honey, I know you have rehearsal, but I'm going to take you." And she brought me into the orchestra level, mm -hmm. and she said, "Now it's no different than when you were a kid," and she was so sweet. I mean, you know, she's like. I think you're one of my only ones who is actually a soloist now. And she, I just, um, I, I performed at her um, memorial service uh, not too long ago and I just loved her. She just took no prisoners in that chorus room <laughs> because if you were gonna be on stage at the Met as a child, you better know what's what. And um, she took it very seriously and she let us know that if we were to step out of line, it would be, to our detriment. So again, artistic habits of mind. We don't go for second best, folks. Um, yeah. So I, yeah, I remember that very clearly. She was, um, she was wonderful. She was a wonderful, wonderful so, person. So you were having this experience alongside your my lessons. Yeah, my voice your lessons. lessons yeah. And and I would assume you joined chorus in high school. Oh, or... absolutely. Did all that. Yep, did that. But when was it? Was, was it sort of a done deal from that age onward or was it a little bit later on and when you decided that? No, um, no, I, I wanted that. I wanted that. I wanted that, that thing that I got to do when I was 11 with Ellen Adoria, you know, cracking the whip. I wanted that. Definitely. Definitely. Wild horses could not have torn me away from that. It is interesting that, you know, the teachers that were, for lack of a better word, strict, at least it is for me, the ones that I remember so fondly are those teachers. <laughs> That kept me in line. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yes. I would say that across the board, that's probably, that is probably my, just even, it doesn't matter what subject, you know, it was the ones that kind of pushed you to your limits and made you cry a lot. <laughs> those people, you remember. Speaking of which, I had one of those at Juilliard, the one and only Beverly Johnson, who made me cry regularly in my voice lessons. Um, but, you know, I, I, 
it's there, it's in there, you know, it's, it's in there, it's percolating. <laughs> Somehow my, my body sort of, you know, finally does what she wanted me to do. I, I'd like to think anyway, although if she came back, she might have a thing or two to say about that. But anyway, um, so it, yeah. It, it's one thing, of course, to have that, that goal in mind. Yes. And it's another thing for it to, to happen. And, and it can, and this, it, it might even be a, this might be another topic, another conversation, you know, and it <laughs> because you, it's hard to put those, it's like, well, this happened, and then yeah. this happened, and then I'm, then I'm singing on the Met. I mean, it's often a chain of events that you can't yeah. necessarily see unfolding when they're unfolding, and there you are. But are, was there, what, what was, what were some of the key moments, perhaps, after graduating from Juilliard that helped you achieve what you, what your goal was? I, you know, I'm going to answer that probably in, in a sort of reverse in a way, because I think anyone listening should know that it's not a straight path, right? Nothing is a straight right. path. And so this idea that like you graduate Juilliard and you just walk on over to the Metropolitan Opera where you will be handed a beautiful costume and enter the stage, stage left, preferably. You mean the Juilliard school? Yeah, the Juilliard school. Um, no, it's it's not that. I mean, I think that, you know, when I, I um, <laughs> when I, teach my class. I, I teach a class at Carnegie Mellon University called Artist as Entrepreneur. And I think that it is about, again, developing those habits of artistic habits of mind that allow you more than anyone to understand that there is just nothing but rejection that lines that path to success. Mm -hmm. So if your goal is, I would love to sing at the Metropolitan Opera, littered with, with people telling you you can't. And I think that's probably the case with anything, right? You, you have to sort of um, make your way and, and your way may not be particularly straightforward. Um, mm. in, in some ways, I think my path was more straightforward than most for whatever reason, but I, but littered with rejection letters and, you know, all kinds of things that could have been just interpreted as setbacks as things that, Oh, I should, you know, I should not do that. I should, I should do this. And I should, you know, maybe I should learn Excel because I'm going to have to, temp for, you know, how is it, you know, I'm sure every student that's going to music school now is thinking, well, if the stages are closed, how am I going to get back to that thing? And am I doing the right thing? And maybe I should take a year off because I have to go to do orchestra in a distanced way. And what does that look like? I mean, these are all, un I, I'm tired of that phrase, unprecedented times, but it is, it is what it is. And it's, again, if you are a person who sees the glass half full, then you look to see what the opportunities are that um, that can propel your art form into maybe a different arena than you originally thought. By the way, I just have to mention that Alvin Crawford says hi, and so does Kevin Thompson. Yay! <laughs> hi! I love them both. <laughs> we both we both love them. So, uh, what was the role? What was what was your debut? It was um, in The Marriage of Figaro, and actually Alvin was there, <laughs> um, and I was singing, um, um, oh my God, why am I having a brain hiccup right now? Right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, it was not it was a low card opera. <laughs> Do you ever have one of those days? I uh, got sidetracked by Alvin. Every day is one of those days. One of those days. Um, it was not Susanna and it was not a bridesmaid. It was the one who loses the pen. That was me. Alvin saved the day, by the way. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you. For anyone watching, yes, I am a soprano. Yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> and I've only had five other Zoom calls today <laughs> that have nothing to do with the marriage of Figaro. So there you have it. But yes, Barbarina with so, none none other than um, Maestro Levine conducting. And it was an incredible cast. And it was a definitely a moment of like, oh my God, I'm getting to do this. Oh my God. Wow. Okay. So yeah. Well, since then, my, my, the reason I asked, sorry to put you on the spot. That's but okay. I knew it was going to happen once during this. I knew. <laughs> the reason I ask is because it's it's of course you had that experience as a young adult, but uh, there's nothing that can simulate. 
you can spend hours with your 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 teacher, with your coach, mm. in 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 the various rehearsal rooms downstairs at the Met. We've all been there and spent many hours, but it's not the same. Even when you have an orchestra rehearsal downstairs, uh, you, when you get on that stage and you hear that orchestra sort of floating underneath you, and you're floating above that, um, and of course the Met is one of the <laughs> it's an understatement to say it's one of the largest opera houses. Um, so I'm just curious what were your, maybe you can't even put them into words, but I've always, I always love asking this question because I, I have a similar experience, of course, when you, when you stand on, 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 step on a podium for the first time and you conduct an orchestra you may have never conducted before or an opera or what have you. And that, that sensation is so unique to that yes, moment. Yeah, I think there's, um, you know what people search their whole lives, you know, for this presence. And I think that's the best way to describe it is that you have no choice but to be fully present. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, things happen. <laughs> so I think that, um, no, there's no way to sort of, there's no way to recreate that. But um, that's what I remember that it's just like this zoop, laser focus and we're here and every, you know, it's, it's not that it's on automatic. That's right. not the point. But the point is that you have rehearsed, that you have had those artistic, ha artistic habits of mind working, working, working for this moment that it kicks in no, despite your nerves, because mm -hmm. I can't, I can't honestly say that I've not been nervous walking out on stage. I am nervous. And I think that's good. When I'm not nervous, I get worried. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I'm not nervous, I get worried. And so I think that if you have enough respect for the music and your colleagues and everything else that's going on, there's some statistic that opera singers and probably conductors are, you know, the most, we multitask the most. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a, just a, really special plane to live on, you know, or, or when things happen, when your colleague looks at you and there's that look in their eye, they're like, I don't know what's next. Can you help me? And it's very, it's like, you're really fine tuned or maestro, you know, it. the singer's looking at you like what's next, <laughs> you know, or what it is. And it's so funny because though I may not have been able to remember Barbarina, I can sing that for you right now, no problem. You know, please don't put me on the spot to do that. But the point is oh, um, that uh, it's it's just one of those things where it just, you lock into place. And I think that that's something that particularly performing artists have that at their um, at their beck and call. Simon, Simon O'Neill says, I'm always <laughs> nervous about you. Mike. Hi, Simon. <laughs> By the way, these are all people who have been so strongly, you know, just aff affiliated with Sing for Hope, they have poured their artistic lifeblood into Sing for Hope. And I'm so grateful because there is no Sing for Hope without the artists that that power it um, with just genuine love and genuine desire to be a part of their community. So my hat's off to you and thank you for, for tuning in. I miss you. We all miss, we all miss all of our friends. So much. You, you brought up something very interesting, and it's it's truly one of the most um, overlooked but amazing jobs that no so few people outside of the operatic world know about, and that's the role of the prompter. Yes. <laughs> and and I I say that because you know what you do on stage. I mean, yes, I. I have a somewhat complicated job on the podium. I will say, but it doesn't doesn't come close to the. I don't have to do it while dancing or while you know making sure that I'm you know from point A to point B. Uh, I, Thank you, know. you for saying that, Maestro. I really appreciate that. <laughs> but there is someone that's usually not seen at all from the audience level that is, in some ways conducting more than the conductor and singing more than the singer and cueing more yeah. than, I mean, it's this, this, this all encompassing art form of the prompter. Yes. Prompting. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Cause I, I think a lot of people watching right now may not have an idea of truly what their, the, that gift is. It's an unbelievable gift. And um, I have only had the opportunity to have a prompter at the Met um, because many, many opera houses don't. They, they don't have that. Um, 
And so what's incredible is that they are such rhythmic masters because what they're essentially doing is just before the beat that you're going to come in on, they're basically going and then they give you the cue. And so what's interesting is that it's sort of like a time space, slow-mo um, experience for you as the singer, because I'm seeing not only the prompt box, which is sort of below eye level and hidden from view from the, the audience, but I'm small. also saying you, Maestro. That's right. It's, it's center awesome. stage. The prompter's box is center, center stage. stage. Center right stage. Right below the, if you're seeing it, you can't really see it from the audience, but from the stage, it's sort of like right at yeah, that. and you, you kind of have to look, depending on how the stage is set up for different yeah. productions. So, uh, you know, it's it's pretty, you, you can see it from, dep again, depending on the production, but it is center stage and no matter where you are, they are positioned so acoustically you can hear them. And some prompters will do, as I did before, like a and to sort of, you know, cue you or some of them will snap at you and they'll just give a cue. And once, you know, if you're starting to get off the beat, <laughs> or if you are losing your text, they will be there right there with you. And so it really is sometimes, you know, in performances, you'll see that, you know, a, um, a, a singer will come on stage and they will definitely bow to that prompt box because that prompter was doing extra hard work um, to make sure that you uh, didn't, didn't forget what role you were singing that night. And of course, of course, prompter, every, every singer on every production there, there, there might be a singer who w won't want much, if anything at all, from right, a prompter. Right. Or other singers will say, "Can you give me a half beat entrance rather right. than a quarter beat entrance here?" Right. right. You know, just and they have to remember all of these sort of. They have a very full score of notes, full of notes, and they have been sitting throughout the rehearsal process too. By the way, yeah, so right. they're they're just as much, if not more, because if you're not in a certain scene, you may not be there. But the prompter is, the conductor is, and they've got everything. And they, they are balancing many, many different uh, parts, many different parts. I am so happy you shared these next two, these new, next two clips, because so often, especially here in the United States, we see only one sort of news from the Middle East. And it's usually not good. And it's negative and um, very one-dimensional. And yet these places, to, in, especially in the Middle East throughout the world, are so rich in culture and history and are current, are still currently very involved with, with the arts. And this festival that you've, you can tell us about now is it takes place in Beirut. And uh, for those of us that, that know there to, still to this day, there are many, many wonderful festivals that happen in that incredible city. Um, Absolutely. I, I have a wonderful relationship with um, several festivals actually in, in Beirut. And my heart is just aching for what's recently happened in this, you know, tragic explosion, which took out so much of, of the the waterfront in Beirut. And these were places that I walked. These were places that I had dinner with friends. I've made so many incredible friends in Beirut over the years. And my relationship started there in 2008. I was invited to perform at the Al Bustan Festival, a festival that's been around for years and years and has had artists from all over the world. It, it is an incredible institution really in Beirut. And, um, and then from there, I developed a, a relationship with um, the Zouk Mikhail Festival. I had the privilege of performing with Jose Carreras and Bryn Terfel and um, Joseph Kaleja. I mean, I've, I've really just made so many tremendous musical memories. I was there also with, with John Batiste and his Stay Human Band. And so to see the destruction that this explosion has created and the deep, deep need for that community to um, to revive and heal, it's uh, it's a it's been very painful to to witness. Um, but I've loved, loved, loved the audiences there. They are extremely knowledgeable. They love music. It is a a place. I mean, it's it's not um, referred to as the Paris of the Middle East for 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 nothing. I mean, they they have an incredibly, as you said, an incredibly rich culture, an incredibly um, devoted audience to everything music and everything um, cultural. 
and so I just am, I consider myself really, really lucky to have been um, given an opportunity to perform there and to get to know the, the people. Let's uh, listen to this first, first clip. <laughs> <laughs> it just is. You're like, okay, I don't know. <laughs> that's uh, brilliant. I love it, Monica. So oh, you, thank you. you. That spirit. I mean, I just, it's like, get out of the way, Deborah Carr. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great song that represents that city, too, because boy, you go there and you're like, Oh, oh, this is where the party is. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay. <laughs> I can't tell. Is that is it an outdoor venue that you're performing? It is. Uh -huh. It's a beautiful outdoor venue. Yeah. Uh -huh. And they, yeah, it's gorgeous. It's set up like an amphitheater and it's just, it's beautiful. And uh, are, most of, are most of the artists in the orchestra and of course the guests are from, from all around the world? Is that how from, it works? From all around the world, but based in Beirut. So mm -hmm. there were people in the orchestra from Moscow and there were people from, locally and people from Europe and yeah, it was, it was, it's a wonderful orchestra. It sounds like it. This next clip I'm very excited to share because you get to sing with a living legend. Tell us about how that, what that must have been like. Um, well, yeah, exactly. It's, it's performing with a living legend. And so it's a little bit like, am I, do I get to do that? Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's go. So, um, yeah, so it was, it was wonderful. I mean, it was really, it was fantastic. It was, it, it's, it's exciting when you get to, be, I mean, you know, when you meet a living legend, it's one thing. And then to have, to have the opportunity to share a stage, it's just very special. It's very special. And for someone who is as iconic as Jose Carreras, of course, and it was, it was a, it was a special evening for me. Let's, let's watch. <laughs> Oh, 
Do have to I do have to mention though. I mean, there's the, the there's nothing. Um, it's, how should I put this? Uh, the amount of years of hard work and rehearsals. Uh, when you hear a crowd of people applauding you for the work that you've done for those, it's not just that moment. It's oh yes, all those moments. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> and it, 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 it does feel nice to have that that appreciation. Of course, it's not why we do it, but it is it that that shared experience is what we're talking about. What Absolutely. we why we are actually doing this show right now is is to cr create new pathways and to talk about new pathways to still connect with that moment that we are all missing right now. Absolutely, and you know, I think in. I, I've talked about this very theme with so many different artist colleagues. And I think, you know, we all agree that it's that energy exchange, right? It's mm -hmm. that sort of most virtuous circle where I'm giving to you, you give to me and I give back, I take in what you give me and I give it back. And, and it's really, it's quintessentially, it's, it's love. It's that energy. It's that beautiful energy exchange. And when it's right, it's, it just, it, teleports you to another plane. It is the epitome of the human connection and why we do what we do, absolutely. The last clip you shared with us is, uh, is, is something I'm sure is very special for you, but it has, since we, I've known that we were going to do this show, I've, I've thought a lot about what your father created. And in, and, and in some ways, I feel like we're, trying to create something similar right now. We're going, we're, we're creating these sort of 
these micro moments. Yes. Because we can't create the grand concept right. right now. That's so, that's so funny you say that, Donato, because um, Camille's been saying that. She's like, micro performance, you know? It's, it's, yes. it's just these sort of jolts of, you know, reconnectedness to community to one another. And, you know, as much as I love this thing, you know, this computer thing, um, it's not like being in person and it's not um, feeling someone else, someone else's energy, just being in their presence. And so I, while I am very, very grateful for it, I am excited to return to a time when we can be together and have this built out option because we've had, we're, we're forced to figure it out. And frankly, you know, there will always be people who will be isolated and, and lonely in the sense that they may not get to experience live performance the way we, we might want them to for a variety of reasons. Maybe they're isolated in an elder care facility. Maybe they're isolated because they are, you know, their immune system is compromised. This happens every day before COVID. And so those people still need that connection, that connectivity. And if we can provide that as artists through a platform that is, you know, tech, tech forward, that's great too. I think now we've just been forced to really experience it in a way that if you've never had an illness like that, that has forced you to be away from people for very long periods of time, we have that as a shared experience and why not address it? Why not address it through one of, one of the things that I think we as humans have as a tool, the arts, as a way to address that, as a way to really come together and say, listen, we, you know, we, we need that shared humanity and the arts give us a, a platform to do that. And if we have to go through a tech, you know, workaround because of immunocompromised things, we should do that. Absolutely. And, and, and getting back to that idea that, you know, what we're, what we're forced to do now are these, these, these small, for instance, from my point of view, from an orchestra's point of view, we can't, it's impossible for us to meet in our uh, full right. state as a right. word. So what we can create now are the, these, these small chamber music experiences, solos, duets, quartets, right. and go out into the community. And I do feel that these many, many, many small gestures will can pay off in in such a deeper way than that than that once a month concert sure. can as well. It's and Absolutely. so maybe tell us a little bit about a little bit about what your father did in terms mm -hmm. of finance and what what leads us up to this final video because. Sure, sure. Very, and, and of course, you're 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 a musician. I'm a musician. We're, we didn't go to this. We're, we're not finance, you know, people. But what your father did is such a is such a seemingly simple and powerful answer, but at the time was unheard of. Yes. So um, I was born in Bangladesh, and uh, my father is from Bangladesh, and um, he is known as the father of microcredit. So he created the Grameen Bank. He's the founder and chairman of the Grameen Bank, which is a bank that loans small amounts of money for income generating activities. That process is called microcredit, and it has been replicated in the Grameen way in over 140 countries, including the United States. So right now in the US and New York and many cities, including San Francisco, um, there are Grameen America, versions of what he created in Bangladesh under the Grameen America banner. And um, as I said, it's been replicated in over 140 countries. That number has probably gone up since I have that stat. Um, and it, there is a bank in uh, Bangladesh um, that loans to millions of women, small amounts, and they loan in groups and they, um, they use it for things like uh, buying a cow and selling the milk for money um, that then feeds their family. And so they are micro entrepreneurs, if you will. Mm -hmm. And there are so many, I mean, I could, I could talk about this for, for a long, long time, but that is sort of, that's sort of the gist of it. He's considered the father of microcredit. And um, yeah, so I'll stop there. <laughs> But it's this this idea that many many gestures of of help of helping one another can create a bed of 
of a healthy, what, what makes a healthy society. Absolutely. And you know, what I think is very interesting about the Grameen model is that they loan money in groups. So you have to form a group. So if I wanted to take a loan, I would have to get four other women and they chose to focus on women in that particular society because, you know, at the start of it in the 1970s, um, you know, my, my dad with, he was a, he was a, uh, a professor at Chittagong University in the city where I was born, Chittagong, Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And his students and he would go to um, go into villages and they would try to speak to, to women who were taking loans from loan sharks and they never could get out from under the loan shark because the interest rate was so insane that they just were constantly paying loan shark back. So he threw his female students because men did not speak to women that they were not related to. He would go into these villages and say, look, I want you to take this money. And the answer was, no, no, I don't touch money. I've never touched money. I have mm -hmm. never touched money. My mm -hmm. husband deals with that. And so to think about the trajectory from you know 1976 to 2020, the empowerment um, of women in that country, not only that country, but very strongly in that country is, is pretty significant uh, to say the least. And you know now we're talking about, you know, many years later, and um, there are second and third generation of, of Grameen um, entrepreneurs, you know, the, so the, the, the children of those initial women in the, from the 70s, those children are grown and have advanced degrees. And so they came to my father and said, well, I have all these advanced degrees, but I can't get a job. So can you give me a job? And, you know, his whole thing is, you don't need a job. You need to create a job. So your mom didn't have a job either, but she created one. So why don't you take your fancy degree and create a job? <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Um, so I mean, it's it's you know it's a fascinating story, and of course he's my dad, so I can uh, I can poke fun at him as he pokes fun at me. Um, but it's it's uh, it's an incredible um, it's in, it's incredible how that empowerment has led to so many different uh, ideas and 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 the creation of businesses and things that, as you said, comes back to the community. And I think, as you mentioned at the very beginning of our our talk, it it, it ties into what we as artists must have when we begin this journey, which is this sense of of self awareness of discipline, of creativity, of, of entrepreneurship. Uh, fearlessness. <laughs> fearlessness. So this this is from the moment where your father was receiving the Congressional Gold Medal of the Capitol Rotunda. What, what, what are you singing? Um, I'm singing Beautiful Dreamer. Let's listen. For my father, Muhammad Yunus, who is indeed a beautiful dreamer. to 
waiting to fade at the bright coming morn. Beautiful dreamer, beam on my heart. Heaven as the morn, the strip that and Dreamer, awake unto me. That's a great way of um, showing a great tribute to your father. That's a great. Yeah, great, it was great. special. It was special. They, they. I mean, it was a huge thing to get a, a piano into the Capitol Rotunda. <laughs> it. I mean, the security level, like it just went on and on and on. And that was wonderful. Michael Bateser playing oh, at, the, at the piano. Uh, accompanying and um, yeah, it was a special day. It was a really special day, and it was a um, it was a um, uh, uh, unanimous vote for to award my dad the Congressional Gold Medal. So that was it was just a very special special occasion for sure. Well, Monica, I don't want to take any more of your time. I, I, thank you so much for sharing all of the things that you've done so far in your incredible career and oh, your, in your life. My pleasure to be here and to. Get to finally meet you, meet you <laughs> in this way. And and as it is with the, as it has been with so many of of mu the musical friends that have been on Music Wise, it's it, we'll find a way to do what we do together, which is make music. Yes. Sometime soon, for sure. Yes, yes, indeed, yes, indeed. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everyone, for watching Music Wise this week.